Okay, welcome to the 41st episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm excited to be speaking to Claudia M. Gold. Claudia is an MD and a pediatrician and writer who practiced general and behavioral pediatrics for over 20 years and now specializes in early childhood mental health. She is on the faculty of UMass Chan Medical School Early Relational Fellowship the Brazelton Institute at Boston's uh, Children's Hospital and the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute. She is a clinician with Volunteers in Medicine, Berkshire's and director of the Hello It's Me project, a community-based program supporting parent-infant relationships in high-need, low-resourced communities. Dr. Gold speaks frequently to a variety of audiences, including parents and professionals. Her most recent book, The Power of Discord, uh, the why the ups and downs of relationships are the secret to building intimacy, resilience and trust, co-authored with Ed Tronic, was released in June 2020. It's a great book. Uh, her other books include The Developmental Science of Early Childhood, The Science Silenced Child and Keeping Your Child in Mind. She writes regularly for her blog, Child in Mind. Welcome, Claudia. Thank you for having me. Mm, well, I reached out to you after a lady I had interviewed probably a few months, three months ago, uh, Suzanne Zedike. She said, oh, you have to speak to Claudia. Mm -hmm. So I reached out and this is how the, uh, the conversation began. So how I like to begin my podcast is just hearing a little bit about you, what got you into the work you're you're now doing? Sure. And I, I love the question. And I'm working on a new book, which brings more of my own personal experience into it. So I thought I would kind of use you as a guinea pig to try that out <laughs> <laughs> and talk because I usually and I will explain about my professional experience. But I thought I would start with a little bit of, of the personal background, mm -hmm. um, which is that I am kind of a as many people are, a, a child of historical trauma. Um, and my grandmother uh, on my mother's side escaped the pogroms of Russia in the late 1800s, came to the United States at about the age of 10. And then my father, a more direct experience, uh, was born when uh, in Germany, uh, the year that uh, Hitler was arrested for trying to overthrow the government. So my Jewish father grew up under the rise of Nazism and actually escaped to the United States uh, just shy of his 16th birthday. Um, and his parents were in a concentration camp, although they did actually both survive. Um, so my parents who are extraordinarily still living at the ages of 98 and 99 are the most optimistic, positive, resilient people I know. But what that meant for me as a child, I'm an only child, is that everything had to be fine. So this is how they survived. Some really, really, really difficult things uh, in their generation and previous generations. But for a child, it was like you angry feelings, sad feelings, any kind of big disruptive feelings which children typically have in a very healthy way were not okay in my home. And it's really only in my adult life that I've come to understand that and the impact that had on me. And so in my own personal development, I've been fortunate to have a lot of relationships that do have room for that kind of messiness and, and my kind of full self was able to come into being in other relationships throughout my life, um, including with my spouse, with friends, with colleagues, uh, very important relationship with a therapist that I do uh, tell some uh, really entertaining stories in the new book about getting into the messiness, uh, my relationship with my children, you know, where I learned that it's really, that's how people grow is when things go wrong and you really don't try to smooth things over, but work through them. So I feel now uh, in a much better place. Uh, and I then have made my life story about giving voice to children who in many, a multitude of different ways and parents also who really don't have an opportunity to speak with their own voice. Um, 
so that's my personal background into the field. Mm -hmm. um, professionally, I decided to become a pediatrician, although I was originally interested in psychology because I wanted to be there at the beginning. And I saw how a pediatrician really has an opportunity to be in a family's life, even sometimes before the baby is born. Um, so I did that, I got very good training, and I was kind of in the right place at the right time, but never really felt that I had the knowledge or the tools to help people. And I would do sort of what you standard uh, advice, guidance. And I began to see more and more uh, kids being diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. It, it was sort of not going well, my, my practice. And then I started to study with uh, the Berkshire Psychoanalytic Institute, and I discovered the work of uh, primarily Winnicott, who, who uh, is British, um, kind of a British Dr. Spock, um, <laughs> a pediatrician psychoanalyst, and Peter Fonagy, who's another person who's had an enormous influence on my thinking. Um, and I began to use those ideas and actually later to the story is Ed Tronic, who I wrote the book with. Um, so uh, I, I began to really get a much more profound understanding of how, why people are the way they are and how to help them when things go wrong. Um, and so I began to put that into practice in my own work, first as a pediatrician and now specializing in early childhood mental health. And then also to write about it, teach about it, uh, speak about it, uh, these kind of uh, extraordinary discoveries uh, that I had uh, made in, in my uh, in kind of uh, fortuitously in this, this kind of off the beaten path career trajectory. Mm, mm. Thank you. I found it fascinating reading some of your journey in, in the book. Uh, it was like, wow. Yeah. And some of just the turnarounds, you talk about the psychology of, say, parents coming in and they're having problems with their teenage son, or mm -hmm. maybe it's even a younger son. And and then once you manage to spend just a little bit of time when the, the mother storms off one time, the relationship really improves between the son and the, the father. I just, yeah, I just really, yeah, I thought that was great, that discord into um deepening of relationships yeah and it, that's kind of how my ideas came to be because i had these experiences and i didn't have a frame mm. to make sense of what i was seeing and then when i learned about all this research and which is generally siloed from pediatricians we it's not part of pediatric training i then i could understand what was happening how i was giving parents a space to be reflective about what was their child's experience by by listening to the parent and how is facilitating these moments of repair um, and that that's why I began to see people getting better mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you I was just down a couple of weeks ago visiting a friend from boarding school who I was the best friend at school and he's now a, a pediatrician consultant <laughs> oh you know it's like like John Bowlby you know you take your we all have sort of similar experiences, the things that didn't go well, yeah, yeah. You, a resilient person, you kind of incorporate them into mm -hmm. your story and then you go to help other people. Yeah. It's, it's a very, it's a parallel kind of thing with Jabolbi, who, you know, the father of attachment theory, who was raised by his nanny, who then left and that, you know, that whole story probably. Yeah. Suzanne. Um, yeah. 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 So <laughs> it's yeah, I did see the postcard he sent his wife, John Balby, at one point, and I think it was Nick Duffel who shared it. And it's just a line saying, P.S. I wouldn't send my dog to boarding school, something yeah. like that. And it was like, Phew, that's the guy who's set up a tax. Right. Theory. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll come on to that in a bit. Yes. I guess at the beginning, I would love, yeah, just to begin, you know, one of the questions Suzanne passed on to me was this idea of, the power of being heard and feeling heard. And I, you know, especially at a, a young age. Yeah. So, you know, the thing that I am privileged to do in my life is to spend a lot of time with babies mm. and you learn a lot from being with babies and their caregivers. Mm. Um, and I, you know, the people who have most influenced my thinking like Winnicott and Barry Brazelton and Ed Tronic, 
have spent a lot of time with babies. So, so let's talk about what happens when a baby is born. Mm -hmm. So humans are, are unique in having our own sense of self. So you have a caregiver, you have two caregivers often, uh, you have this person arriving who has their own set of unique qualities right from birth. And that's one of the things that Barry Brazelton really um, uh, was really uh, brought to the fore in his work. Um, and they get to know each other, just like you and I are, are getting to know each other. Um, and it's through that process that, that the baby's sense of themselves grows. Like, okay, so, and it's, uh, so that's where that kind of solid sense, uh, I am me in kind of a hopeful, optimistic way emerges by these moment to moment interactions early uh, in infancy. Um, and so that, you know, that's where that the power of being seen as yourself allows yourself to continue to develop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Being seen as yourself. Wow. I love that. I mean, so I, I think that I could give you many examples of older people, but I think it really starts with the baby. Um, so for example, I, I think it's helpful if I give you a concrete example. So let's say a baby is particularly fussy. A mother who uh, was in a situation of domestic violence during her pregnancy might uh, attribute meaning to that child's fussiness that the child is trying to make their life miserable. You know, those of us who are in the field hear things like that all the time. So that baby very early on has the experience of not being seen as themselves. They're seen as this kind of, with the projection of the negative attribution of the other relationship. Hmm. And that already begins to affect their sense of themselves versus a, a, a parent who can kind of meet her baby's distress and, and listen to it as being not her distress, but the baby's distress and help the baby. And another thing you asked me about is contain it. Mm -hmm. um, so help the baby contain their big feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and when, um, uh, you know, so, so that, uh, that's how misattributions uh, and in experiences from the parents' own history interfere in their ability to see the the babies, what Winnicott called full self, yeah. true self, I should say, not full yeah. self, the true yeah. self. Yeah, yeah, I think I wrote that as a, a quote from page five, true self, parents' own issues may cloud their views mm -hmm. of who their children really are and of what their children's behavior is communicating. And I guess that was a, a question further on that feels like it links into what you're, you're saying here is, how is it for, certainly in the UK, we have certainly the upper classes, have we have nannies from mm -hmm. a young age. And so mm -hmm. there's almost like that split from the family, the mother and father, very early on, because, I mean, I've heard stories of the, you know, the nanny and the child live on one floor and the parents and the mother and father live on a different floor. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering that attachment break that we have. It, it's not really discussed. I know I've spoken to Simon Partridge on the this podcast before last year, and he talks about this idea of the upper class complex trauma syndrome, which is this idea that we talk often about boarding school being the break, which Suzanne Zedike pointed out, but actually could there be an earlier break? How does that affect a child who has a mother and suddenly is then given to the nanny? I mean, in your experience, how, how does that affect a child? Well, I, I think it's really important to say from the outset that it's different for every mm. family. Yeah, yeah, because I, I think we have to be careful to not make broad sweeping generalizations that mm -hmm. whole swaths of society are bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think that you can have a situation where a child is raised by a nanny. Mm -hmm. And, in, you know, in this country, certainly we have the situation where parents work full time and so they have full time childcare or the babies, you know, in daycare. 
those are not necessarily problematic situations mm -hmm. um, because as long as the primary caregivers, and in many cultures, there are many primary caregivers are available in ways to kind of be present and work through the messiness. It doesn't have to be all day long, but it has to be some time where the caregivers are fully present with the child. And then if you have other caregivers who happen to be the child care providers or the nanny, who similarly have opportunity for engaging in that kind of relationship with the child, you know, that's all of those relationships make up the child's sense of who they are in the world. Um, so they, it becomes problematic when those uh, robust, messy relationships where you're kind of figuring each other out and you're taking the time to really listen to each other, when those don't happen and you don't have a sufficient quantity of those uh, healthy, messy, figuring yourself out kind of relationships. Um, you know, and then I use the example of John Bowlby. So it's not, what happened with John Bowlby is that his nanny left abruptly. Mm -hmm. So it was a real traumatic loss. I mean, and I, I, so I want to be careful not to say that going to boarding school across the board is trauma, although <laughs> I do think that eight is awfully young mm -hmm. to be going to boarding school. Um, so you could make that argument, but it is a cultural phenomenon. This is what you do in, in mm -hmm. the UK. Um, but you have to look at the nature of the whole complex of relationships within an individual child's life. Uh, in order to get a sense of who that person is or what their vulnerabilities are. Mm, mm, thank you. As you speak there, it reminds me of something John Balby said about his nanny saying that that helped him to form his ideas about attachment. And he's something along the lines, if he hadn't had that, he feels his life trajectory would have been very different. Those yes. Experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah yeah and i i do see that i see that that's kind of something i try to bring into the podcast is you know that for some boarding school really works for some it doesn't i think it's like this idea of discord it's like to have the conversations what we've often done in this country in my opinion is we just don't even talk about it right right i'm in men's circles with ex-boarders some are in 60s 70s they say they've never even talked about what happened Right, right. And I think, yeah, it just, just sort of like uh, there's a parallel to PTSD that if you've had a lot of early developmental trauma or early developmental relational disruption, I mean, I think the word trauma is a little bit overused because mm -hmm. life has a lot of disruption. But for kids who've had a lot of early developmental disruption, emotional neglect uh, or physical and emotional abuse, uh, then put them in the boarding school situation and they are much more vulnerable. Their, their sense of self is very, can be very fragile. Then you're going into a situation where uh, that's where you get this kind of problematic behavior that I know people have been talking around, about around uh, the leaders in the US and in the UK um, where there's this you know very fragile self which results in what we typically see as narcissistic behavior, the constant need of outside verification that you're okay, which is because if you think about it, those that core sense of self, that sense of agency that emerges in the very early relationships is fragile yeah. um, and so really vulnerable. Um, so I think you really have to connect it to the whole life story of the person and not just the event of going to boarding school yeah thank you thank you yeah that's useful to, to to see and it makes me reflect as well i lived in africa for about a year and i noticed the young children were often not just looked after by their mums it's often their sisters you know they were strapped to their sisters who were maybe eight mm -hmm. or nine uh, exactly. and, and you know and i i've heard this about the sand bushman um this idea that often they would have 20 or 30 people that they would be able to go and speak to if they had an issue or problem. And it's almost like they could find that messiness. Again, living in Ghana, 
hearing this story of a child walking home that if they'd done something wrong by the time they got home their parents already knew about it because the whole of the neighborhood have said do you believe it they've done this <laughs> exactly. yeah so man you know around the world and many cultures don't have this one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. like primary attachment conception they don't even know what that means mm -hmm. <laughs> that we have in, in western cultures so um yeah so we really have to take that into account and think about the many different ways that things can go well yeah 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 thank you thank you um i think i mean you've spoken a little bit about containment uh, and winnicott's work is there anything else you'd like to add in there you know about containment sure you know i, I thought i would you know the best way to really understand what we are talking about is to look at parents and babies um so i thought for your uh, listeners i would just describe a little video clip which they can find uh it's a, a video of a comedian michael jr uh called delivery room uh and he is speaking to his just born baby mm -hmm. um so you see her you know, wet and sticky and crying. And then he speaks to her and you see her, her movement still just, he's not touching her. The nurses are still doing their stuff, but he, you see her movements kind of calm and become still and organized. And then she starts crying again because the nurse goes to put on her diaper. And then he starts to speak to her again. And as he's speaking to her, not only does she become still and organized, and then he says to her, I love you. And she opens her eyes and looks at him. So to me, that is containment. So he is with his voice. She, you know, that's life. It's a metaphor for life. Things happen to you, you, you know, uh, the nurse comes and changes your diaper or somebody fires you from your job, you know, things that are noxious happen to us. But in relationships, we, we can manage ourselves. We can stay calm in our bodies. We can be in intimate relationships throughout disruptions. Um, and that's what this kind of moment to moment. And in, in, in the video, you know, it's not all smooth. I mean, the baby starts crying again. So so he, his presence and his voice and his ability to stick with her through some tough times here at the moment of birth represent how that happens throughout our lives. And that is the kind of containment in a, in a multitude of relationships that helps us to feel calm and healthy, a kind of sense of agency, a, sense, a positive sense of self and an ability uh, in turn to be close with other people. Thank you. Thank you. And just kind of looking at the common thing we have in the UK is single mothers. So the father will just will kind of leave or there'll be a, a breakdown. How does that affect containment when that stability of, like you say, um, Michael Jr. with the voice holding? Them? Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, so we certainly have that uh, here in the United States, too. So I think. Uh, what Winnicott talks about is the, the holding environment. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how the mother needs to be held in proportion to her need to hold the baby. Um, and so in our cultures, we don't have that. And certainly uh, for a single mother, that's a particular challenge because to, to do this by yourself mm -hmm. um, is really hard. And so we need to be mindful as a society that mothers need their own holding environment. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's where things like quality childcare for a single parent can be actually wonderful for both the child and the parent uh, if it works out um, and a support system for a single parent, you know, the community that classic, it takes a village um, really looking to the mother having her own uh, sense of being held and and the realizing again in proportion she's we're, we're talking about the mental and physical health of the next generation so so really we need as a society to pay attention to how we hold our caregivers whether it's a single mother single father 
uh, and, and all the other multitude of, of stresses that, that parents can experience. Thank you. Just brought to mind, I worked as a, a forest school teacher, which is, we set up these forests in the UK and we have children come into them. And I was mm -hmm. based in Manchester, which is a big city. Um, and one of the, the children, it was two boys, their parents were going through quite a messy divorce. Mm -hmm. And for a period of time, they're really angry mm -hmm. and, and we kind of contained it, but having the space, it was just, you know, sat in a circle on logs, but they could go and scream. Or I also worked one-to-one -one with a boy who was in care. And in the mornings, often he would go and run around the woods. And one day I just said, you know, uh, asked him about it. And he says, oh, I was pinned down today in my home. And mm -hmm. I just need to run around and mm -hmm. often in the UK in our, our, our schools they're contained in a classroom and they're punished if that you know and having that space having yeah. those caregivers there yeah yeah I, you know I think that's a it's a wonderful example of uh you know not only the importance of sort of thinking outside of the box of how to support kids who are going through really difficult times, but how the meanings we make of our experience are in our body. So, so we, you know, it's more than just talking about what happened. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's being in, in, in out in nature and, and, mm -hmm. or dancing or drumming or, you know, Bessel van der Kolk uh, writes a lot about this yeah. uh, in his book, The Body Keeps Score when kids have experienced uh, developmental disruption and, and trauma that really um, a multitude of opportunities to use your body in ways that allow, I mean, sort of putting all the ideas together that allow for messiness and mismatch and repair. You think about, um, you know, dance and how you, you, you go through a rehearsal and you make many mistakes and then you come up with this coherent whole and things like that are also opportunities for, for healing when there has been um, a lack of that kind of robust, messy mismatch repair in early childhood. Mm, thank you. So maybe we'll come back to that in a bit, but that off, that's kind of almost seems like a solution. So if, because I think that's yeah. Yeah. partly a question I have, which whether I put it down there or not, but I've had more come over the weekend is this idea that if we've had a trauma, like, you know, most of the people, childhood trauma or say boarding school. And then it's what I'm hearing is having that space to dance, to sing, to on a physical level is one pathway to healing by being yeah. more embodied to have that yes. experience. Yeah, you know, we, we have in our book, I use the story of uh, Prince Harry. He's yeah. there in, in the UK. Yeah, yeah. We have these uh, royals who have a very public life. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so even though I really know nothing about him, um, I could see a, a, a lot of this, what we're talking about. And it, it actually continues to play out in, in what's going on now with the royal family um, mm -hmm. in that, you know, so he was uh, someone who it appears had a very robust, loving, healthy relationship with his mother. <laughs> he did go to boarding school at the age of eight. Mm -hmm. um, but then of course she died, mm -hmm. uh, very horribly traumatic loss for him. Um, and you can see, because it's, their lives are kind of on display, a kid kind of falling apart and drinking and, and really losing his bearings. And then you can also see, because this is all very public, things that happened that perhaps were what got him back on track. One thing which he's very public about uh, is being in therapy. Uh, and another is that he was in the military and he talks about, you know, I think just the experience of the relationship with the other people and, and kind of getting outside of himself and, and having that collective experience. Um, and then you wonder about his relationship with his wife, which seems to also be something that gives him a very strong sense of himself as you see now. And again, I don't know 
the backstory, but I do see someone who has kind of a sense of agency. One gets the feeling that he was not in a good situation for his family and he did something about it, which, which speaks to you know, some very strong early relational experiences in his life. Um, so, and then another example from your royalty, if you don't mind my no, borrowing, because <laughs> <laughs> I find this fascinating, is uh, Lewis okay. um, yeah. and Kate. Um, you know, Kate uh, is a very strong proponent of children's mental health and actually works closely with Peter Fonagy, who is the director of the Anna Freud Center. I don't think that's his exact title, but anyway, uh, clearly someone who um, is very invested in, in supporting children's mental health. And then you saw um, Lewis you know, in, in his full delightful self and in this kind of sense, I'm, I'm sort of answering a bunch of questions at once as I talk about <laughs> my fascination with your royal family. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that you sense the sort of presence with this kid who at this very public event is, you know, doing all sorts of disruptive things, um, <laughs> being his true self. <laughs> so anyway, that that's a, a lot of really where, where the healthy things come from and where you can look when things really go wrong later in life. Mm, mm, mm. So, it's almost like I'm hearing with Lewis having the messiness and to go, yeah, that's all right. Rather than, I, I guess, when I've seen the past with the royal family is the children were very regimented. Yeah. You weren't allowed to mess around. You weren't allowed yeah. to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you see a very different kind of, of attitude coming from her, at least you know what i can see from the media yeah and yeah. i get that she she is very much about this uh, you know she works with peter fonagy who has this uh, core idea about reflective functioning and that that informs a lot of my work too in mm -hmm. fact my very first book keeping your child in mind was all about his idea or his research um that really healthy emotional development emerges when the people who care for you are we're able to reflect about the meaning of your behavior rather than simply managing your behavior. Um, yeah, that's another really important idea, which is not so much in the power of discord, but is is a lot uh, present in a lot of my other books. Mm. So I guess that would link me in to uh, which I've not put down as a question. So I apologize if I'm putting no, it's fine. Is this idea of managing your behavior as a parent? So, this is something which I often hear from ex boarders is that because the parents don't see them, they miss the little cues. They come home from, you know, half term and they've not seen them for three, six weeks. Or I've heard people three, six months. Yeah. Whereas a parent, their child comes home, they're not talking on an evening if they're, they're at day school they start to pick up there's something wrong whereas almost this managing the behavior those cues are missing so yeah how does that affect a child yeah i think that that's an, such an important point it's just a question of the number of sheer interactions you have with a child mm -hmm. you know um the moment by and if you don't have those moments then you can't really figure each other out um and so they don't really know their child in a way. If you miss these huge segments of just like, you know, when you got a math problem wrong and the teacher yelled at you and, and or, you know, little things that happen throughout the day and, and throughout our lives. And, and yes, your parent, the, and they, so they're kind of naive to what, what's going on uh, in their children. And, and that can, um, you know, have untoward effects. I, I, I'm going to bring it back to babies because I think it's very helpful for us to root our yeah. thinking in babies. Yeah. Uh, so I, I worked with a mom who was struggling to feed her baby. She was uh, uh, a lot of anxiety around breastfeeding that the baby wasn't gaining enough weight. Um, she, her husband's a musician. So they traveled and she had this like 12 hour period where she was alone with the baby. Um, 
and she describes how, you know, she, she, it was so wonderful because she didn't feel like she had to make this baby stop crying all the time. She could just kind of lean into it, like, and figure it out and go with the flow of, of the moment by moment interaction and how by the end of that 12 hours, which was exhausting, but she felt so much closer with the baby than she had. And so, yeah, I think, again, for a family where there's been a lot of that before they went to boarding school, the child's probably better able to tolerate those kinds of separations. And I should also add that in a good situation, they have other relationships that are ongoing in boarding school, you know, with their peers, with teachers, those can be very helpful, but they can also be very harmful, you know, if there's bullying and if there are abusive teachers. So, so those relationships continue to inform the way that child is developing. It's not all on the parent, but there is a kind of uh, a, a way in which parents and children ha are vulnerable to being kind of estranged from each other if they have such long separations when they're so young. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I do sometimes do this in my podcast. I, because you the great answers i'm like oh but then i think oh i'm going away from the questions but maybe we, i usually right. find afterwards i'm like oh no actually we've answered them all so <laughs> um, yeah. yeah um and i now lost my train of thought so i'll go back into some of the questions but thank you i find this fascinating it's like um yeah and maybe that was it i think it's something i've i've heard is you know, maybe it was, I don't know about Prince Harry because you brought Prince Harry up, but I'm wondering about, you know, when his mother died, because I've often heard this at school is it's the the messiness. That's one thing. So I was at boarding school from age 11. Mm -hmm. So while I was there, a friend committed suicide. So it was very mm -hmm. challenging. We weren't allowed to grieve. So there mm -hmm. wasn't a chance for us really to be messy, even though after this guy's this friend's death our boarding house for two or three months was very messy as in we just created chaos because we were grieving but we didn't cry but i'm just wondering you know like with prince harry and i've heard other situations of parents who have died and uh, my pediatrician friend was sharing a story of something which happened at, at school when i was young younger saying about how um and I'm not sure if I can actually explain the story without giving this away, but just the idea of uh, somebody passed away and it was like, right, just get on with it rather than actually having a chance to be messy and it to be OK that they're grieving. So, yeah, um, I hope I'm making myself <laughs> clear there. No, but I, I think this is a central point because often what underlies the um, need for certainty, you know, that's another thing we're gonna get into, yeah. this, this need that, that has to be a certain way and, and this regimentation, often what underlies that is an unmetabolized loss. Mm. Um, so, you know, in addition to creating space for messiness in relationships is the need to, uh, create space to grieve um, because a loss so often underlies so much of uh, people's uh, behavior. Um, and, and so, and Harry, again, he talks about this quite openly that mm -hmm. there was no opportunity to grieve his mother's death until much later in his life when he did uh, enter into what sounds like was a very meaningful psychotherapy for him. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you I think it was for me in my 20s I hadn't really cried or grieved I'd lost my father and a few friends mm -hmm. I was mid-20s and I started to work with a psychoanalyst um, oh, okay. an American American lady actually um, a lady called Barney Shorter and she during that time I started to work with my dreams and mm -hmm. suddenly tears for the first time in 15 uh, years I started to cry but every day it was yes and that was the grieving process yeah and at times I've often heard this for 
for people who've been through childhood trauma who weren't allowed that uh, messiness they feel like there's a reservoir of emotion they're like i just can't go there yeah yeah because it just feels like i'm just going to be blown apart yeah and and the work of healing is to find to be in a safe enough space and in a safe enough relationship like it sounds like you were with this woman mm. that you can um access mm. those feelings and uh and move through them i'll tell you uh, since you shared a personal story I, I tell you in in my very up and down and incredibly messy relationship with this my uh psychoanalyst um it was like there were ma major disruptions, but but I would say the last chapter um, was just crying the whole time. You know, that, the same thing, like it, it, it just takes so much work to be able to get to a place where you can feel safe enough to begin to metabolize that. Okay. Yeah connects yeah to some emotion there it's like yeah yeah thank you i've kind of i say thank you a lot on the podcast someone made that reflection the other day mm -hmm. but in appreciation um yeah sounds like that was important and i guess that brought up memories of my own psychoanalytic relationship it felt like when i was working with this lady it was the first time i was ever able to push against someone mm -hmm. and she was like Yep, I meet you. And in yep. the past, everyone had just left. We're going, no, oh, I can't handle your messiness, Piers. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 exactly that's what is healing is that ability to like push back against mm. uh, and not, you know, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. So um are we doing time with this? see that's the interesting thing time goes really quickly on these things i'm like oh no i've got all these questions still to ask <laughs> um so the other one was this is kind of also came from suzanne zedike um this idea boarding school is full of experiences are full of unrepaired ruptures I'd love to hear you speak about the impact of those and okay. maybe if i can give some context of that maybe one of the things I found was that, and I've heard this from dozens, if not hundreds of other people who have been at boarding school. This idea that one guy said, I left home to go to boarding school 180 times, over from age six or whatever through to 18. So every three weeks you leave home mm. and then you come back and then you leave and then you come back. So it's like these ruptures and I remember, and I've heard this from many people, and they still have it now, when the end of summer holiday comes along, suddenly you feel this fear because you've got to go back to school. Mm. And then you're back, you get used to it, and then you've got to go home. And so I guess that would be for me, you know, there's obviously different ruptures there. Um, but I wondered, yeah, what is the impact? Hey. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to just settle on, uh, just talk about language for a minute, because in our work, we use the word mismatch rather than rupture. Okay, yeah. Because yeah. rupture suggests something sort of uh, a little bit more violent or, mm. I mean, mismatch is kind of a healthy thing that happens in relationships. This is normal. Yeah. So I wonder if what you're talking about is not so much rupture as what we were just talking about, but loss. Yeah. every time is this profound loss because it's a separation that's really beyond a child's ability to manage. I mean, you asked another question about how old um, can parents and children be separated? Mm -hmm. So I think it, it can be separated from a very young age as long as the way in which it's managed is proportional to their own capacities to tolerate it. Um, so I think when you send a child that young uh, away, it's a really profound loss and a, and a kind of sense of disorientation because you know the other isn't there. Mm -hmm. So they kind of lose their sense of who they are because there's still their sense of self at such a young age is really very much interrelated with their relationship with their uh, 
their caregivers. I mean, their siblings, their parents, their, the whole, so they're ripped out of that. So I think what happens is this loss after loss after loss, that's not, and then people have to steal themselves against that because this is their life, 180 of those. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can imagine that in order to survive that, you have to become in some ways closed off from your emotions. You have to become pretty, I mean, again, it's different for every person, but you can imagine that people would need to become kind of rigid in their thinking Mm -hmm. uh, that a need circling around to this idea of certainty, a need for certainty is, is protective because otherwise you would just be a total mess every time you had to leave home. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's that reframing it is, is helpful in any way. That is. Yeah. Thank you. And a lot of people do and use mm-hmm. the word rupture, but I think that the mismatch word uh, highlights that it's a, it's something that is healthy and normal. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. 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 I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah. And it's that space of being able to grieve and to repair um, yeah. that. Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, so you've kind of spoken about that. Um... Yeah, can I say just another word about one of my favorite concepts from Winnicott, mm-hmm. which is this idea of going on being, which is that you, you just sort of in this give and take, uh, the, the mother goes away, she comes back, she, the, you, the child gets the sense of existence through time. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the time is beyond what the child can tolerate, it, it creates a kind of existential crisis for the child. Like if, if the mother, if there is, the mother is not there and it's beyond the child's ability to kind of hold on to their sense of self, mm-hmm. then it's like a, there is no me, this, this, this disintegration of the self, which is a very, very excruciatingly painful psychological experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. I think that was, I noticed that with boys in my, my boarding house is, those that were really struggling, they would get bullied until they were able to maintain, you know, if either they were crying, getting angry, they weren't being able to manage their emotions. So I, mm. it was an open dormitory with 25, um, 30 boys in there. Um, those that couldn't manage that, they would be picked on until they stopped that behavior. One of the ways I learned to do that myself was aiming that hatred at myself so Mm -hmm. aiming the attack because it was that much better to have one person myself attack me than having 30 Mm -hmm. yeah Uh, so that's an adaptation yeah yeah. that's where like the yeah exactly it's a self-protective mechanism yeah 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 um so yeah i'd love you know one of the questions was just about certainty um you know, you mentioned about your new book. And my question was uh, how certainty and how it leads us away from growth and healing. Um, You mentioned that page 226. I'd Mm -hmm. love you to to explore a bit about the power of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think we live in a time, uh, the, the anxiety that people experience in the world, you know, politically, COVID, economically, it's, it's just kind of over the top now. <laughs> um, in fact, when we wrote this book, The Power of Discord, we had no idea just how much discord there was going to be in the world. The book came out June of 2020. So, so I think when we see dangerous certainty emerging when people feel extremely anxious, mm-hmm. um, and so we see that certainty in the polarization in our politics in the US, um, people stop being able to have any ability to to listen to each other. It's my way of understanding is the right way. Um, And that leads to all sorts of problems. But if you you again, think back down to the the baby and the parent getting to know each other, it's, it's allowing when you can say, well, I'm not 
not, I don't really know who this person is, but I'm here to figure it out and I'm not always going to get it and I'm not always going to know and things are going to go wrong. That's where, you know, I've said this several times now, but this is where that sense of agency, uh, that sense of self ability to manage yourself and to be intimate with other people um, really comes out of that when, when you cannot really know exactly what's going on. And I find this also in my clinical work. I mean, this is a whole other podcast um, about, you know, pediatrics and child psychiatry and the need to kind of put people in categories and label them, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I think, problematic when it comes to really being able to listen to voices of children and parents. But I found that when I am very intentional about saying, I don't really know where we're going. I don't feel the need to say, well, your behavior is X and there's this way to manage it, but let me just come into the room with you and see what happens and not know where we're going. And that's very uncomfortable for me as a clinician. It's also uncomfortable for the family, but if we don't do that, then we don't uh, get at what's really going on. Um, so I talked about that, that mom who um, was having trouble feeding her baby. Mm-hmm. You know, at a, at a later visit, she shared about the death of her own mom and how this grieving, she was so sad when her child was born that he would never know his grandmother. And that, that just, I, I would have no idea if I hadn't just kind of created a space for her to tell me the story and me to be curious rather than saying, okay, you need to pump every three hours and then give the bottle, you know, so into the uncertainty and into the not knowing comes opportunity to grieve loss and to really discover meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing. I don't really know where we are going just to be open to asking that question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting for me. That's probably been one of my biggest struggles. And I is that control, that certainty. And maybe my judgment is that's what I see a lot with our leaders is that certainty. This is how it's got to be. Mm hmm. And I think, yeah, one of my key teachings around the time I was working with this psychoanalyst, I was also living in a Buddhist monastery. And Mm. so I had that safe container and I was struggling so much. And I got to that point where suddenly had an insight and the insight was I have to just let go of getting my own way. As soon as I did that, I was like, oh, this is so much. (laughs) It was like lovely. And and taking that into my relationship with my wife now Mm. is like, um i wanted everything to be you know right and try and manage everything i can remember in the monastery i was trying to right that's not working with that person how do i fix it and i I love in that book your book is just i don't really know what to do i don't know where we're going that uncertainty yeah Yeah, and and to suspend that you know sort of allow yourself to be surprised you know Mm. um in a relationship I think um, is also another way. Yeah, you, you just didn't didn't expect that this is where we're gonna go. I, I, I'll just share, I know we're coming towards the end, but uh, I, I've learned probably 99% of what I know from my own now young adult children. It's okay. <laughs> and, you know, going through in, in the pandemic, particularly with my, my son going through some really tough times and then seeing him kind of, discover these extraordinary things about himself that that if we had said no you have to get a job and, and you ha- or, or been more sort of controlling and rigid about it uh he would never have uh, found his way and you know and he's also very uh you know brave in in terms of being able to not exactly know what he's going to do and the ability to be in that very kind of painful space when you're a young adult and don't know where your life is headed. Um, again, led to some wonderful things that if he had, you know, just gone to graduate school because he didn't have anything else to do, it, it would not have worked out like that. <laughs> so yeah. that's just a, a per, another personal example from yeah. my own. Thank you. Thank you. It just reminds me of uh, Robert Bly's 
book uh, Iron Johnny talks about the time of ashes in the Vi time of the Vikings that young boys becoming men they could choose if they wanted to just sleep in by the hearth and cover themselves in ashes they didn't have to do anything for that time and it was almost like a, a liminal space and they, after a few months or a few years, they would then decide, right, it's time for me to become a man. But they were allowed that space. A liminal space, yeah. That's yeah. a beautiful image, yeah. Yeah. If you've never read uh, Iron John, it's like, that's such a beautiful... Uh, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> beautiful book by Robert Bly. Um, and, yeah. yeah. So, um, I guess as we're coming to the end... I mean, one of the things I would love to, I mean, you, you've interweaved this beautifully, different ideas, you know, question nine, I said, if you've been through rupture, mismatch, childhood trauma, boarding school, you know, how do we start to heal it? You've mentioned that throughout. Is there anything else you, in your experience? Well, I, I think just uh, reiterating that we, look to babies to find the answer to that question. Because if you think about your core sense of yourself as hopeful, as um, having a sense of agency, uh, a strong sense of yourself in the world comes from moment to moment mismatch repair. So if that did not go well, then the way to healing is a whole other set of opportunities for uh, moving through mismatch to repair. So we tend to, as a, you know, we tend to think of these sort of one or two dimensional solutions like CBT or mm. even EM, I'm learning a lot about EMDR, which I think is a fascinating form of therapy. Um, but the idea is that if we look to where our sense of ourselves and our meanings come from, it has to be very broad. Mm -hmm. You know, the forest thing you were talking about, uh, dance, walking, um, uh, martial arts, uh, multiple ways and, and traditional psychotherapy um, that, and multiple relationships um, offer that kind of opportunity to create a newly hopeful sense of yourself in the world. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I love all of that. Yeah, martial arts, I do martial arts. Uh, on a Wednesday, uh, yeah, and I found, like you say, so many of these things. It's like pieces of the puzzle. Puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, I love. Found one of the things for exporters is talking, having a safe space. You know, we meet every few weeks online, and just going, "Hey, this is what happened to me," and then going, mm -hmm. "Wow, I'm not alone." Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rather than yeah. we often get judged as exporters because we're mm -hmm. privileged. Who that you know? Who are we to be speaking about this stuff? You had a real privilege. I've you know mm. we often yeah. get that, well. so we don't talk up, we don't speak up. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So psychotherapy, forest bathing, martial arts, uh, dance. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> I like all those things. So thank you. So as we're just kind of coming to the end, uh, how do people find out more? about what you do, your books? Is there a best place to, to get hold of your books? Uh, well, I have a website, claudiamgoldmd.com. And on that website, you can sign up to receive my newsletter, which I send out about every three to four weeks. Um, and I write on my blog and send those out as well. Uh, and you can also purchase any of my books from that same site. Great, great. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll put links to your website. I've kind of put them down there on the description. So please go and uh, uh, go and visit her website. Also, please do read this book. Uh, this is brilliant. I really love so many times I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure I haven't asked half the questions I wanted to ask you. But uh, yeah, maybe if we've got another seven hours, I could ask you. More. <laughs> Uh, but thank you thank you any last things you'd like to share before uh, we stop well i i really appreciate the the opportunity to put these ideas in the context of this specific issue uh, of boarding school which i know many in, in the uk really are 
are grappling with. Uh, so I, I think it's been an interesting uh, meeting of minds. <laughs> and I, I thank you for that. Mm, a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for your, your work. And uh, as I say to all my guests, if I can support you in any way, please do just reach out. Uh, but thank, you. thank you. Okay, I'm going to press stop now. So thank you. <laughs>